Hello folks, welcome to my little mini-series on implementing Tetris in Erlang as a, an end-user GUI application. Uh, I'm breaking this up into some shorter videos instead of one giant long one uh, because people, I think, have a little bit of trouble navigating those huge two-hour-long videos that, you know, describe an entire system in detail. Uh, so I'm going to break this into components, which is easy in this case because the way that I implemented uh, Tetris is mostly component-based, or at least kind of, there's sort of themes to the way the commits go. I started off thinking about data, so I'm going to do this video on data. Then uh, there's a couple of procedures on data that were obviously going to be needed that I implemented next. You know, just basic motion around uh, the field, the, the play field in Tetris is called the well. So moving a piece around the well, um, was obviously going to be needed, so I, you know, wanted to make sure that I had my head right about how to actually do that uh, before I got into anything more complicated. So I'll make a video about that, uh, which also includes how I, you know, how I made the GUI even exist, um, or at least how how I drew the play field at all, uh, and then moving on through actual gameplay features, uh, you know, collision detection. Um, block, you know, barrier detection, so, you know, if, if a move's legal or not. Uh, and then some of the kind of finer details towards the end, like scoring, and, you know, how, how do you decide what a score is, how do you decide how fast le different levels should run, uh, and so on. So, um, three or four videos, we'll see how it goes. This one is definitely going to be about data, so I know that, so we can do that right now. Uh, this is the Airtris is the name of the project that I made. It's not a particularly, uh, <laughs> it's not a, not a very um, smart name, I guess, but it's the one I picked because I don't really care about names that much. I care about variable names a lot, but project names I'm not so good at. Anyway, there's only 13 commits in the whole thing so far. I'm sure there's a couple bugs lurking in there, so there will probably be a few more commits, but within 13 commits, I was able to get to a reasonable version 1. Uh, this constitutes about 10 hours of work uh, spread across a few different days. I did a little bit of work one day, had a bunch of other stuff to do, came back another day, did a little bit of work, and then yesterday I was able to actually like knock out the game and make it really actually work right. So, um, well, well before, before I dive into the actual code, let's just look at what we have. Um, I'm going to run this from Vapor, which is the reason I'm doing that is I could do, you know, ZX run Aerotris and it would run right away. Uh, Vapor is the way that Windows users are going to see this. So we'll look at it from inside of, of Vapor instead. So Aerotris, uh, you pick, you know, from the from the list of options, you pick Aerotris and you just click run and it runs. We're presented with a well and we'll start a new game. Uh, we see the next screen populate and you know that's it. Uh, so spacebar is hard drop. Actually let me pause this. Uh, or well, never mind. If I I can't open the help menu. Let's see. So instructions. I bet I think the game's still running in the background, so I'm gonna be all messed up. But anyway, movements the arrow keys, rotation is Z and X for left and right rotation, hard drop is space. You can also press up. Yep, see it kept going. You can also press up to do a left rotation, uh, and that's that. Um, it's a pretty basic uh, implementation of this game. It works. There's no wall kicks or anything. So if you're a, a big Tetris, you know, aficionado, then there are not wall kicks implemented here. Um, this plays the same way that the old Game Boy Tetris did. So if you're curious about the minutia of gameplay, like what, you know, how each different thing about it works, um, there's no wall kicks or floor kicks. If you're stuck against the wall like this, you just can't do rotations because you don't have space to move. So that's that. Um, another, anyway, it works the way you'd expect a Tetris game to work. Nothing very spectacular there. Um, 
what we want to look at is these initial commits. So the very first commit, uh, you can't, this is too small to see in the video for most people, especially if you're on a phone. You can't probably read any of this. Um, so I'm going to have this blown up over here uh, so we can read stuff. So we're going to check out the first commit here. And we see we've got four modules. Um, the reason we've got four modules, and if you've watched the other videos I've made on using ZX to create uh, GUI programs, you'll know that if you do ZX create project and pick GUI, as the type of project you want to make, you'll get these four modules templated by uh, ZX for you. And that's exactly all this is. So if we did ZX create project, pick the GUI uh, type. I'm not actually going to do it right here, but pick the GUI type and it will template uh, these four modules for you. What those four modules does is really just gives you like a hello world. Um, if we do ZX run local, we like we just get this um, hello WX right and it's got a text field and it just prints whatever arguments you passed into it at the command line we didn't pass it any but if I do some arguments it'll show some arguments and that's it that's all this is so this is the the first commit is just a ZX template um, let's get the second one going here um, the second commit we've gone from four to six modules we see the original controller the GUI and the supervisor those are as they were before the new things are what I added was peace and well uh, remember the play field inside of Tetris is called the well and I don't know really what the pieces should be called, so I just called it a piece. Um, so that's what we've got. Uh, these are, I wrote these two modules at first, uh, knowing that there's a couple of things that I need to be able to do um, to access the state of a piece or how a piece should be represented in the world in terms of like coordinate blocks for points. Um, and I knew that the well is going to have dimensions that I'm going to need to know. And I know that I'm going to have to, once a piece locks into the board, it's going to have to exist in the board somehow. And the blocks, it, well, that's not quite true either, is it? The, the, the blocks themselves, the, the, uh, the game pieces, decompose once they're locked into the board. Because when you remove a line, right? You're, remo you're removing individual blocks. You're not removing a whole piece at a time. So the idea of a piece kind of goes away and gives way to a de decomposed uh, state of whatever blocks were falling. They have to now be independent inside of the well, and the well is going to have to remember uh, the state of, of whatever pieces are in it, whatever blocks are inside of it. So, um, so I know that that's true at the outset. Uh, but I don't know exactly how I want to represent the data inside the code. Um, I don't know if if I do everything as lists or whatever. Would there be an efficiency problem? I don't know any of that stuff yet. So I just took a rough stab initially at making data types and defining. The most important thing is picking what interface functions are going to be defined over those data things. So let's take a look at uh, the well. This is the play field where we're going to be. So. I uh, I created a new uh, function that will just return a new well, a new two, and what two is is I could put dimensions in there to change the size of it. New is just going to give us some defaults. Uh, then if I have a well, I don't know the dimensions of it necessarily, uh, so. Because if I called new, right, it's defaults, but I don't know the dimensions. So I need to be able to figure out what the dimensions are elsewhere in the program. So I've got a function where I can ask the dimensions. 
Um, fetch. Fetch is uh, asking the well, if I give it a coordinate, what's at that coordinate? So, you know, take a look at, at the, the current status of a specific block in the well. That's what fetch does. And then store is kind of the opposite of that. Put a value in the well and keep it there. Um, and that's that. Now I've got a type exported that's play field. And the play field itself is an opaque type. And I have decided to represent the well as a tuple of tuples uh, to kind of make accessing individual members easy. Uh, so I can use indexes. So the way this works is if I call new, it's going to call new 10 wide by 18 tall. So new width and height, I'll get Erlang make tuple of height with the value inside of it being a row of whatever the width is. If I look at how row is implemented, and this function is not exported, um, the row is making a tuple with x. And when we look at the piece in just a second, we'll see what x is. X, the, the atom x represents an empty, a blank square inside of the well. Uh, and for dimensions, the dimensions function, we pass it a well, which we know is a tuple of tuples. It gets the height of the well by checking the size of the outer tuple. Then it gets the width of a row by checking the size of it. I use, pick element one here. It could be any any of them. Um, anyway, by pulling a row out and then checking the size of that row. So we extract one row, then we check the size of that row, and that's the width. So we've got an outer tuple that's we've got an outer tuple that is the height every row here that's the outside one and then inside of each one we've got uh, each row is a separate tuple so we're checking both sizes returning those as the width and the height uh, fetch to get a value out of the well we've got x y right um, so x is going to correspond to width and y is going to correspond to height uh, so we pull out the y element from the well so how high it is and then we pull out element x and that's it like this is a really boringly easy thing i didn't realize it was going to be like this concise when i was writing it but um it turned out to be really really simple stuff so uh store is the reverse operation right so we're gonna get a row out at whatever the height is then we're going to update one member uh, at whatever x is, what, you know, the, the x value. We're going to set this value into that, and then we're going to store that newly updated tuple back into the well. So the most inside function here, element y, we're getting the row that we want out. So that's this becomes the row. Then we're setting the x membered element of that tuple to value so this becomes the updated tuple and then set element at that original y value within the well with that updated row so this is the old row this is the new row and then this is the new well that gets returned back and that's it it's like it's so simple that uh, there just wasn't really anything else to do. Um, now I could add some types here, uh, some type annotations and things. Uh, I wound up just not doing that because doing GUI, <laughs> GUI stuff, um, problems with types usually jump out at you immediately. Unless you're doing business software, then it's not true at all. But for like a game like this, the code's so small that, you know, I mean, this entire module fits that would this at least this version of the module fits on a single um, screen at this gigantic resolution uh, so it's not a big deal so we, we've got this idea that we have a tuple of tuples that's the playing field 
and we can put a thing into one one square and we can get a thing out of one square and the field is going to start out with just x's it's going to be a tuple of tuples that are just x's when we get a new a fresh field and x means blank that there's nothing there so now let's go look at what a piece is so pieces um, that's loud uh, anyway pieces uh, we've got a few functions here that we're gonna like that I knew at the beginning I was gonna need one is random I'm gonna need a random piece I don't know if I'm going to need to specify a piece type and call new you know give me a new piece of this type or not I do know that I'm gonna have to flip pieces around uh, I have not decided whether or not pieces are going to know their location or if that should be something that the controller is aware of and the piece is just kind of in the world by himself. <coughs> so this version of the pieces are not aware. They don't carry the information about where they're located on the board. They just carry the information about their orientation, uh, which I've represented as is this thing called the flip count so there's only four ways a piece can be oriented uh, so I've just decided that those are one through four and that's it um, and their type is a single atom one of the Aeraltris possible types uh, if we well if we look in the main Aeraltris module there's a type list there and it, it's it's just these these are like the standard Tetris uh, representation letters. I is the bar. O is the box. T is that little, you know, the one with the one thing sticking out. Um, S is the squiggle that's, well, I guess, facing you guys, the squiggle like this. And Z is the squiggle like that. J is the, you know, the, the L that faces that way. And then L is the one that faces the other way. And that's all the possible Tetris piece shapes. So each one is a single letter. These are all atoms. If you're not familiar with Erlang, an atom is not a string. It's not characters exactly. They're more like uh, aliases for C-type constants, um, which just it makes it easy for us in a program like this to get very quick references like that because the runtime takes care of all that stuff for us. So anyway, these are atoms. If you're curious about atoms, go look up the airline definition and it'll explain it to you um, so anyway uh, so a piece only carries two types of data it knows its orientation and it knows its type and we've got defaults it starts out at flip one whatever that means uh, I hadn't really decided yet now we're exporting a type here data and if we look at the definition of data it's an opaque type uh, and it's just this record record P represents piece um, so if I'm programming along and I get a crash and I see P somewhere, then that, that means piece. Uh, so get a random piece, get a specific type of a specific new piece, like of a specific type, flip a piece right or left and points. What points is, is give me the coordinate offset. Uh, if I know the location, I need to know the offset of each block that is a piece. Um, so those are the four things I can do with this module to start with, and I knew I was going to need these functions. Uh, I didn't really know what else I was going to need, and I hadn't fully decided how I was going to um, do all this. But I did know that, like the points, I'm going to have to iterate over them to draw them. So I figured a list, uh, a list of coordinates, so a list of x, y values was probably a reasonable approach. Um, same thing with flip. I hadn't really decided. I mean, I could I could do up, down, left, right, or north, south, east, west, or something, but what I opted for was just to make a numeric rotator. Um, so if, if we flip right, we take the flip value and increment it by one. But if we're already at the value four, uh, we're going to reset it back to one. So it's a rotary, right? It goes all the way back left. Now there's, I know there's a, what if the value is five, it would just keep going up forever and so on. Um, 
this captures the entire range of possible values that actually occur in practice. But uh, if you're wanting to fuzz a program, then yeah, sure. Um, you know, this this does have a potential runaway. Uh, and I could do modulo, you know, the, the fully bug-free version of this would, would be using modulo math and then dealing with the remainders to guarantee that it can't ever go too high or crashing on too high of a value. But um, this works and whatever. It's Tetris. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, so anyway, a right flip increments the flip number. A left flip decrements the flip number. And of course, when we hit one, we go back to four because we're rolling over the other direction. Uh, points. Points is a little bit more interesting. Um, points, we know the flip, the orientation, and we know the type. Now, based on those two things, there's going to be a set of points that describes what a piece is. And there's two ways I could approach, well, I guess there's three ways to approach this. A pure math guy would say, okay, four blocks, all connected at right angles, none can overlap. With these rules, I can derive every possible Tetris piece. That's true. And if you derive every possible Tetris piece, you could also derive the four possible orientations and their relative point values. That's also true. But instead of sitting and staring at my desk until Insight hit me, which actually I think I just figured out a way to do that. Anyway, I don't care that much about this. Um, instead of deriving all the possible point values, I just kind of look, you know, in my mind's eye, what does an eye at what this orientation look like? What's, if I turn it to the right, what's that look like? And so on. And, uh, I just wrote them out. Um, that that's all offset is. This is like, a this is basically like a really fast hash lookup. Um, it's just a lookup table. So we know the flip orientation and we know the type. So we're going to have the types here, the I, 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 O, T, 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 S, 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 I. So O, the O is the box. You can't really turn it. So it always just returns the same points. So we don't care what the flip orientation is for that one. Um, so points calls offset, offset based on the type of piece and its flip or its current orientation we return the point values that correspond to describing that piece. And I literally just like typed this out by hand thinking about like, I mean, it's not that hard, right? Tetra, there's only four blocks. Um, so I just sat there and thought, okay, like how, how far does this go? And how, you know, I, that's all I did. It, there's no magic involved here. I just sort of sat there and like typed them out as I thought about them. Again, you could do this more, like in kind of a more mathematical way, you could come up with a, I mean, you could make a, a matrix value, you know, for your piece, and then you could rotate it, like literally just do a matrix rotation operation. Then you could report the point values back. Uh, that's another way that you could do this. Um, and that would be more like mathematically correct. If we were doing a bigger sprite game, uh, with like lots of hit detection calculations and pieces could rotate very finely. Um, like for example, if we had a sprite that could rotate through a wide range of degrees and maybe it had a very detailed outline, I'm not going to hand write that. Then we really would calculate and, you know, we would, we would calculate angular rotation and get all of the exact pixel values, all the exact border values and report those back. This is Tetris. It was easy to do this, so that's just what I did. Um, you can criticize the approach. That's fine. Uh, just understand that you know this is not the approach we would take if the models were much more complex. We we really would go the kind of more mathy route. Um, so that's it. That this is the whole module. The whole thing, sixty six lines, and most of it is actually just these offset things. Um, that's it. Uh, and that's it. Like, that's this whole commit. There's really nothing else going on. I don't even know. I don't know what happens if I run this. I'm not sure. Okay, so it, this is printing. This is the internal well. 
if if I go look in the code here, almost guaranteed what happens is the uh, controller starts up, creates an empty well, just calls new, you know, calls et well new, and gets this and prints it as a string. So this is the internal model of what what the well looks like, and and as we can see, it's completely empty. There's nothing there's nothing in the well. Uh, and that's it. So I'm a bit curious. If we go here, so this is the uh, you know the boilerplate stuff. Oh, here we've got new game rotate. I did put a couple of functions in here, but they don't really do much yet. Uh, I've started. I know that we're going to have a window that we're talking to. Um, I know we're going to have a well, and see right the default is already et well new. Uh, and the initial thing that we do is, um, okay, et GUI show instead of showing the arguments from the original template, I gave it this term well, and the uh, GUI. Let's find show. So show terms is going to give it a cast show terms. Um, okay, so do show. All this is going to do is take uh, the terms. So there's a text control. That's the main thing in the in the GUI window. Um, it takes the terms, which in this case is just that uh, the tuple of tuples that represents the empty well. It's converting it to a string, and then it's updating the uh, the text control with that string, and so that's what we see on there, and that's it. Like that's kind of the whole thing that happened. Um, you see, we're not handling new events yet. Um, I think I've got. Yeah, I don't even connect this. This was really just the data model layout to start with. Um, this particular commit. So the. Uh, Closed window is the only thing that the frame actually even connects to. Uh, it's the only the only GUI event that we're able to see uh, at at that moment. So uh, so that's all that's all we've got in this first commit. Uh, I say first commit. The one after the very initial commit uh, is just the data models. Um, the next commit after that, we'll look at this. Uh, Real quick here. The next commit after that goes from the data model of the well and the piece, those two pieces of information, and it takes the next step, which is can I get a random piece and actually show it on the screen? And this is where we're going to step halfway into the GUI world because I wanted at this point in development I'm like okay I'm pretty sure this data setup is going to work out uh, now I need to make sure that I'm not getting ahead of myself I need to v be able to visually understand that what I'm doing in the the data part of the program is actually translating to something that I can show on the screen competently um, so the next the very next uh, commit is draw the board with a random piece on it. Now to do that I have a number of hurdles I have to step over. One of them is I have to be able to draw not text on the screen but the images. And the images in this case are very very simple. Um, if we if we step back here we've got a new this commit introduces a new directory called sprites. And if we look at the sprites that's it. It's just these, um, there's an I PNG, there's a JPNG, an LPNG, and so on. I just made some PNG images in GIMP uh, with like the standard Tetris colors, which I looked up on a, there's a Tetris wiki out there, and it says what the standard colors are supposed to be. So uh, I made, in, I just opened up GIMP, made a flat um, 
30 pixel square of whatever that color was for that type of uh, piece. And then I used the bevel filter to like make it look kind of like a that block shadowed effect. And that was it. Uh, then I just like rem to make them tiny, you see they're only like 200, they're all less than 300 bytes. Um, I reduced the color palette to like eight colors total or something. So they kind of got bleached out, but that's okay because who cares? The, the effect actually turned out pretty nice. So I was fine with that. The blank one, the X, is just a black square and on the right and top, uh, I put like a gray line. And what winds up happening is when you put all of them there, it looks like a grid, um, which the effect came out pretty cool. Uh, I wasn't really interested in getting any fancier than that. So that's literally all the art that went into this game is just those PNG images. Um, so let's take a look at what happens with uh, the GUI, because that's going to be the most interesting thing here. Um, actually, before I show this, let's take a look at what it looks like. So we've got a score thing, we've got a count thing, and a time thing. The time thing actually goes away later. I didn't use it. We've got some junk on the screen. I'm actually showing state. Uh, the reason was I wanted to look at um, I don't think I can move yet. Yeah, there we go. So I'm just checking events. Uh, you see this little SSSS here? That's what this is. So this is literally drawing exactly this scene as described in Adam's uh, tuple of tuples um, here, just showing the PNGs that are the S's. And like, that's it, that's the whole thing. So what, what I was also checking this version was I had kind of forgotten what the different keystroke values are and I wanted to check what they were real quick. So um, this is the actually the WX event for getting a character hook event from the keyboard, um, which just means input happened. Now this is not key down, key up. Uh, like if we were looking for long presses, this is just from the, uh, from the graphical system, sending a character, a character value into our program is char hook. So we're going to see that we attach the panel, uh, attaches to the char hook or maybe the frame does. I don't know. We'll see. Um, We've got these bitmaps, so sprites, the sprites are represented as a bitmap, and we'll we'll see this in just a second in the code. Um, so this version, all this version does is it creates a random piece and it puts it on the board and it listens for any keystrokes, so I can start figuring out like what are the arrow key numbers because I don't remember what the keystrokes were. Um, Z and X, I know what the values for those are in ASCII, but sometimes keyboard key codes are like different. So I just wanted to check what those were. Uh, so let's look at the GUI here. Now we see this has changed significantly, right? We have a, we had the frame before. Now we've got a board and that's the panel. So that's actually what we're drawing on. Um, the panel is a, uh, it's a drawing. It's a, it's like a graphics drawing content, 2D graphics drawing context. So we can put like bitmap images and we can display those PNGs in there. Uh, the well is what we had before. It's just one of the, uh, you know, the tuple of tuples well. Um, next, we hadn't implemented that yet. Uh, that just stays blank for a long time. I, you know, right before making this video, I actually finally implemented that feature. Um, so that, that came at the very end. Score, we know it's text control. Counts, text control, times, text control, but um, we're not doing anything with them yet. Sprites is probably the most interesting thing here. Uh, I haven't decided what I'm going to call it yet. Uh, so instead of enumerating like a specific type here, I'm just calling it sp sprites initializes our sprites value. Sprites the function. Sprites the data type. 
uh, is just an alias for this type of map right here. So it's a map that must have these values, and those all correspond to uh, WX bitmaps. Uh, we've got a new, now ETC, I hadn't decided yet if we were gonna have a settings or not, which I decided against in the end. But right now we've got uh, two constants defined, which means that these are, in, in WX code, you'll usually see, if you've got some specific values like this, it usually means you're gonna use those as uh, menu item IDs um, to match on in later events. So those are just defined here, but we don't do anything with them yet in this version. Uh, init. This is where we we start a new WX server. We start a new frame. Uh, a frame in WX is the window that you see on your screen. A wind. So the terminology in WX is a little weird. Um, frame is the window that you see on your desktop. Window is anything inside of that frame is a window in the terminology of WX. So don't get confused about that. Frame is the window. Widget is a window. Frame means window. Window means widget. That's how WX describes things. So when you read the documentation in WX, don't get confused. Uh, I start a menu bar here. I've got two items, game and help. Uh, these particular things don't actually go anywhere yet. Those events will come in, and they'll just get printed in the uh, event log, like, hey, I don't know what to do with this. And we'll, we'll see where that happens later. Um, so I create these menu bar items. I add them to the menu bar. Then I set the menu bar for the frame. I say, that menu bar belongs to this frame. And, and that's good enough. Um, board. Remember, that's the drawing context, so we need a panel for that. Uh, well, actually, I'm not being quite accurate. A panel is something you can display stuff inside of. A drawing context is a specific thing where you're filling a bitmap buffer, and then you can put that into a panel. So you actually you create a drawing context, you draw stuff in it, then you give it to the panel, and then you destroy that drawing context in, like, in WX, you actually have to do it that way because WX is actually written in C++, so you have to call a destructor in certain cases. Uh, it's not automatically garbage collected, so um, we'll see how that works in a second. Uh, we get a new blank well. The reason we get a new blank well is I haven't decided yet how we're going to size everything. Uh, so we get the dimensions of a default blank well. Now I know all the pixels are 30 by 30. So we're going to multiply the height, uh, the, the width and the height to get the, uh, the board size in pixels. And then we're setting the size of the board to, uh, to the pixel dimensions that we want. Uh, that is going to, because the panel now knows how large it has to be, it can now tell its parent, the frame, when we add it to a sizer, the sizer can ask its child, which will be this board, how big are you? It's going to say I'm, you know, width times 30 by height times 30. And now it can tell the sizer, oh, I have to be at least this big. And it can tell the frame, oh, you have to be at least this big to show everything on the screen. Uh, so setting the size is kind of important to get right. Um, oh, st so this, is, this section right here is just stats. That's the score, count, and, and uh, timer. Um, they all have the same, they all start out with the value zero. Uh, they're all read only. So I just kind of, at, I didn't want to type that out over and over again. So, and of course I could loop, I could make a function that produces these for me uh, and just returns the values back instead of typing this out, you know, it's three lines, three different times. Actually it's four. I have to type these out four times, right? Um, GUI codes like that a lot of times, and you know it, it can be repetitive. I don't really care about this little amount of repetition. If there was a bunch of stuff, if we were reading documents uh, from the outside, and I was going to print documents, and they always had these fields, then of course this would be abstracted into a function somewhere. Um, but here, I just don't really care because I'm my goal is not to make this into beautiful functional code yet. My goal is to get some pixels on the screen so I can 
uh, test, I can assess whether or not I can competently show those uh, bitmaps that I made, or the, the PNG images that I made, and actually draw Tetris shapes on the screen or not. So I don't really care about this yet. I just kind of put that in there uh, to, to fig play with the sizing of the, of the initial window. Um, so the main sizer, we have to make a main sizer, and that's going to take up the whole screen, um, the, the whole frame, right? Um, we're going to have a stat sizer that goes inside the main sizer. Uh, now we're going to start adding stuff. So we're adding the board to the main sizer, and we know it needs to expand out and fill up space. So we're adding expand proportion one here. Then we're adding the stat sizer to that. Now remember, the main sizer is horizontal. So if you add more things, they go out this way. If you have a vertical sizer, they stack in this way. So the main sizer is going to put stuff side by side. The stat sizer is going to put stuff from top to bottom as we add things. So we put the board into the main sizer. Then we put the stats sizer into the main sizer. So it's going to go to the, you know, to the left of it. Then we're going to put the score sizer into the stats sizer, then the count sizer into the stats sizer, and the times, uh, the timer sizer into the stats sizer. So we've got the board, we've got the one big sizer that stacks things this way, board, stats, inside of stats we've got chunk, 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 stack, stack, stack. So we've got a little list right there of uh, stat stuff. Then we're going to take that main sizer that we made and put it into the frame. And the ordering here is a little bit arbitrary. You can do it any way you want. I like to do the big frame stuff at the very bottom to kind of tie it up. Um, so we're setting the sizer for the frame is the main sizer. Everything in WX is arranged by sizers pretty much. And unless you're in a drawing context, then you get like specific like pixel values. Um, then we call layout. The layout function over the main sizer tells the sizer to uh, evaluate from its innermost children to the outermost children how big they should all be and make sure they're all lined up correctly. If you don't do that, you wind up with like crunched up, like everything will be like drawn on top of each other in like one pixel. Um, so you want to lay out everything to make sure that, you know, everything is arranged and has the correct amount of space to, to actually show on the screen. Uh, then we're going to connect the frame to the close window, uh, which we saw in the, if you remember a few minutes ago, we, we looked at this code briefly and we saw close window in there. Uh, that is that the X. So when you click you have a, a window on your desktop. There's a little X at the top, or an OS 10. It's like up in the top bar, or whatever. Um, when you click that, it's going to send an event to the program, and that's the close window event. Uh, there's a few other ways to generate that event, but you, it's up to you as a GUI author whether or not to listen to that. Um, when you get a close window, you know, when someone clicks that X, maybe you're writing like a really important business application and you're saying, hey, you shouldn't just close this yet. You need to save stuff or, hey, you have unsaved work. Do you want to save it before you close or whatever? Those type prompts are possible because we can intercept the close window uh, event separate from other events in the system. You don't just have to close down immediately. Uh, the window managers don't force you to do that. So... They let you do important things like check, you know, check and make sure that your user ha doesn't lose any important work. But on the other hand, it means the burden is on us as GUI authors to actually catch that event and shut the thing down. Uh, and then we connect um, char hook. That's what I was saying before. Uh, when a key press event goes in, a, a complete key press event goes in, not key down and key up. Those are separate events you can listen for in a different way. Um, but char hook just means that a key went, you know, a key press happened, which also means uh, if your desktop is set up for repeated keys, like you hold down a key, you hit the letter A, and after you hold it down for like a second, it goes A really fast. Um, those are all independent char hook events. So that's what we want for game control here. 
so we're going to listen for that. Uh, and I put that on the panel, but it could be on the frame. I, it, okay, so this is a weird quirk of, I actually incorrectly have this WX panel connect frame. WX is object oriented and there's all these layers of inheritance. So actually what's happening is frame and panel all trace back to WX window. And I th maybe it's WX object, I don't remember. Um, they all have the same ancestor in, in terms of object oriented inheritance. So they all have the same connect function on them. And this code is generated uh, the the WX airline bindings are generated, I think most of them are generated automatically uh, from the interface definitions in the C++ code. Uh, and the end result is that WX panel connect is an alias for WX frame connect. They're all like the same because I think they're all aliases actually for WX window connect. Um, so I actually incorrectly wrote WX panel connect frame whatever. But it doesn't actually matter because they all go back to calling the same thing anyway. And I th think in a later version I fixed that. Um, this is correct. The board is a WX panel. The frame is not. It's a frame. We're connecting to the paint event here so that we can redraw the screen in case the user resizes this stuff. Uh, which if we, if we look at Minesweeper, that's actually really important. In Tetris, it's not so important. Um, So we're setting the client size, meaning we're setting the size of the client viewing area, not including the border. So the border is going to be bigger than that. So the viewing area inside of the of the frame that we're going to show to the user, we're going to set how big that is. Now I know it's got to be at least 30 times width of the board or of the well and height times 30 of the well. I don't know how much space I need for the, uh, um, score and like that other stuff. I don't really want to play with proportions right now. So I just put 300 pixels in there as kind of like a meh, it should be okay, probably kind of value. Um, and it was, it worked well enough. Then we're going to center the frame on the screen. Then we're going to show the frame and that's it. Now you notice the return values here are a little bit different. And some of these are throwaway return values because I don't care about what WX object is returned. Um, Every line has an equals on it, but some of these are throwaway values. So we don't care about them. Um, I am a l not completely, but I'm a little bit of a Nazi about making sure that every line has an assertion that something completed correctly. Uh, even though in WX, the truth is that if we, uh, if WX frame show fails, the whole WX server is going to crash anyway, and that'll crash our program. So eh, anyway, not that big of a deal. Um, the things that we need to keep track of, we need, to, we need to have the frame, we need to have a reference to the frame, we need to have a reference to the board, we need to remember what a well looks like, uh, and then remember the score, this is not the number, this is the text box that actually holds the number. So we're keeping references to the time display, the count display, and the score display, so that we can update their values as the game progresses. We don't do anything with these yet, but we know that we're going to need them. So all this stuff in the initialization phase of creating that first window layout is all here. Uh, in addition, we if we go back up and look at the state record, uh, the state record has a sprites value, and it initializes itself with sprites whenever you create a state record. So Sprites is right below that because it really is kind of part of initialization. So I, I put them together in the code. Um, what Sprites does is it asks the ZX daemon, like, where where am I? Where am I running from? Because it, if you run the program from a ZOMP repository from ZX, it's going to be located inside the ZOMP library compiled stuff directory. Um, if you're running it locally, then it's going to be the current directory. If you're running it from, you know, uh, ZX render, and then you give it a path, and it's running a project from a path somewhere, it needs to know that path. So th this is the way that inside of your program you can find where anything is. Is you ask ZX daemon um, where home is, 
and then file name join. I know that inside of the sort inside of the project directory, I've got that directory that I created called sprites, and so that's the uh, image directory, and then PNG type. This is a bunch of junk to type out. It's kind of weird. So um, WX bitmap new. We're joining the file name, the image directory with the PNG type that we know goes with X I O T S J L whatever, and they're all PNG type. So I've just aliased that out here. Um, so this map just it, and this is happening inside of map definition, right? So this map is just generated real quick and returned, and all those PNG. Uh, bitmap values are already loaded in, um, and we never load them again. We're not gonna we're not gonna go back to the file system every time we need to draw a block because that I don't know that just seems silly. Uh, so we load all the sprites at startup time. Uh, now we've got the um, WX object is an extension of Gen Server, so we've got all the basic Gen Server stuff that we'd expect. Handle call. We don't have any calls actually, so. All, all calls are unexpected. They're all just going to log a warning. Handle cast uh, show. We have that interface function show. And we know that we're only showing the well. So show well, do show well. And that's going to update the state, and, and that's that. Handle info. We have no naked messages that we're expecting, so all naked messages are unexpected. And we have handle event. Uh, handle event only handles one event right now. Close. Now remember, we're listening for key presses. Because I want to know what the key presses are. And I want to see the state. So this is me. What this code is letting me do. Remember, we listened for char hook, which is a key press. And we listened for paint events um, in addition to close. So we're matching on close. And we're stopping the program, destroying the frame, and retiring. Right? We're killing the program here. Um, any other event, such as char hook or paint, that we've already said we're going to listen to, uh, I'm going to print out the event completely and I'm going to print out the state completely so that I can kind of see what's going on inside. There's other ways I could inspect state. I could turn observer on. I could check, you know, the, the, I could uh, run this from the, uh, the shell and interrogate state using system commands. You know, I can do any kinds of different uh, runtime state inspection that I want to do. This is the easiest, simplest way to just all I want to do is see what the shape of a WX key press event is because I always forget that. Uh, what the key codes themselves are that I should match on when I want to start implementing motion commands. Uh, and I want to see that well, like printed out in text so that I can, you know, see if what I see on the screen, the piece that I see drawn with pixels, matches the image that I've got. Uh, or the well, the well state that's held in memory here. So that's all this is doing. Uh, so code change. That's a you know OTP standard thing. Terminate this OTP standard thing. Do show. Now this is where it gets interesting. Do show. Uh, well, now I'm updating the state here with the well. Then I'm saying redraw new state. So what happens here? is what's interesting. Redraw. I need the board. Remember, the board is that panel that lets me show like arbitrary images. Uh, so that's a WX object reference, right? So I can call the WX server and say, show this, or manipulate this uh, GUI element. The well is the thing that we just established here. We just updated the, the state record with that. And then sprites. Remember, sprites is that map of uh, every possible um, image type every you know which which block type matches what uh, what piece so like yellow is the the little o one and X is just the black square because there's nothing in it and so on and we're gonna draw the board using this so we're gonna use that well dimensions command to figure out how big everything is because we want limits and the now this is what I said before we have to uh, create a drawing context so the board is the thing we're gonna put an image into but we have to create that image first from components or drawing stuff in there so we need a drawing context first so we do 
client DC, client drawing context, and we create the drawing context. And here I'm checking to make sure that nothing's like going haywire. I'm actually printing out the uh, um, tell. Tell is a ZX logging thing where it'll just, instead of just showing up in the log file, it also prints a standard out um, the, the DC value here. So I just want to see that that's a true thing, uh, that that succeeded in case any of this fails anywhere. This all turned out to work out just fine, but, you know, messing with drawing context is kind of finicky, so I wanted to check that this is right. Um, and then we're going to call the function draw from the first first block, first block, so the first coordinate, this is like an x and y, then limiting by maximum, the, the max is the width and the height, into the drawing context, the status of the well, using these sprites. So what we see here is we've got, if the width matches width and height matches height, then we know we're actually done. We still have to draw that final thing, but we're actually finished here. Uh, if the width matches the width, but the y value does not match the height, if these are not the same, then we've finished a row but we still need to advance until y equals the height, right? Uh, and I could have done this with guards, but I just did matching in the function head here. Um, so what, in this case, we need to advance y and start over with x back at 1 to get to the beginning of the next row, right? And call draw again. Uh, and this is our most common case, actually, is the one at the bottom here draw x y w h so draw the thing at this x y coordinate and we're just retaining the maximum possible values so we can check for them because we don't want to run off the edge of the thing and if we try to fetch something from the well that's out of bounds it'll crash uh, so we don't we don't want to do that um, so we're gonna fetch the thing at that xy value, and that's going to give us the type, right? The type of it. And the type is going to tell us inside the sprites map what's there. Um, and paint. Every one of these has a paint, right? Paint, paint, paint. And this fetch could be abstracted away down inside of paint, which I actually do later. But here, I just don't care. I'm just trying to check. Uh, I, I just wrote this out like to see if it would draw stuff or not uh and then i you know later on i actually i think i put this fetch down in there so this the draw stuff shrinks a little bit um so we're gonna get the type out and then tell it to paint that type into the dc uh into the drawing context using those sprites and so of course what we have next immediately is uh image inside of paint x y we have the DC, we have the drawing context, we have the coordinates, and we have the type, and we have the sprites map. We're going to get the image out of the sprites map. The coordinate to start drawing at is going to be. Um, remember, uh, the coordinates are zero based indexed for WX stuff. Inside of Airline stuff, though, it's all one based indexing. So the first element in a tuple is element one. The first coordinate in WX starts at zero, zero. So the origin is zero, zero. And so we have to take X minus one, Y minus one, multiply both by 30, and that gives us our coordinate value. So we're going to draw bitmap in this DC, draw that image at this coordinate. And once that is done, that, that's gonna return okay if it's successful. Uh, once that happens here, we're going to loop again with draw, and we're going to just get the next the next block over from where we were at. So that's x plus 1 on the same y value. Once we go through all those x's, then x is going to equal the width. So we'll match on this case, which means that we need to go start back at 1 of the next one, like complete this one, then draw again, starting at 1, the first element of the next row, and the way we get the next row is incrementing y by 1. And once both of these are maxed out, that's the last one on the board. So we can just be finished with it. 
Um, and that's it. So we call paint one final time on that last block and that returns okay as long as it doesn't blow up. And then we have to destroy the client drawing context. When you destroy that drawing context, what happens is that's the moment that everything goes up into that panel. Uh, so destroying, destroying the drawing context actually makes the draw buffer get painted to the actual screen so that you know users can see it. Um, well, that's the way it works at least here. I don't. I'm not a hundred percent sure whether or not the drawing context is synchronized on Windows or other platforms, but um, here it is. So I think that's the same everywhere, but you know, different systems could work very, very different ways. That's why WX abstracts this all for us because we don't want to know the differences between the different platforms. Um, so the end result is that uh, we can draw a well, an arbitrary well. We can draw uh, an arbitrary well. So let's check out what the controller does here. We know that when the GUI started up, it draws a blank well first, right? When we just ran the program, we never really saw it. And that is because in init right here, the controller init, the way that controller changed was it got, uh, it starts up the GUI with the title Eraltris instead of hello WX. Um, the well here starts out as a blank well and we're just pulling that out of a state a blank state record then we're getting a random piece we're calling piece random because this is the whole point of this is i wanted to kind of verify i wanted to make these functions do something so i could verify they worked right um so we get a random piece and then we call place the piece in the well and the way that place works is I picked a random location in the well that wouldn't be too high or too low. So I just started at position 5-5. Five, five. Uh, and, you know, that's that. Um, so the piece itself has got a point offset, right, that I need to know. Um, that's what that, that, like, table of values, like if you have an eyepiece, then it's at, like, at 0-2... Zero two one two 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 three two to draw a line, uh, the the block line uh, thing. So that's you get the the points out of the the piece module there. So we get a random piece. We pass that to the function place. Place is going to find is going to ask the the piece itself what are the what are the points what are the coordinate values for your your points, uh, and what's your type. The reason we need type is we have to know how to update the well with that those types right and remember type is one of those atoms it's like uh, i j s z or whatever um so we're getting that and then we have this function called update it's going to close over the well itself uh, it's going to close over the uh the type so that we don't have to like remember it every time um so we get a coordinate it takes a coordinate and it takes a well and it stores the type that we know here at the offset. Like whatever the offset is. So remember, uh, position X is 5, position Y is 5. We're getting a list of points from here. The point coordinate offset by the position five by five, right? Um, that's going to tell us inside the well, the location that the next type value needs to be stored at. And now we're going to use uh, a fold. We're going to call update over each one of these points, starting with the, the blank well, right? And we're going to update that as we go. Now, actually, I had made a mistake here. Um, and Erlang was kind enough to let this kind of go go by, but um, I have masked well here, which is not really good. I've masked the uh, the variable value well. 
So in future versions, I think this has changed to just W. So it's a it's an independent label. Um, but we're going to update the well. Et well store returns the well the updated well back right. And the fold is going to keep calling this function over the next version of the well iteratively until at the end we just we have a new well. So what place does is it takes the piece, it gets the point offsets for that piece and the type, and it updates the well, each point in the well that corresponds to a block of that piece, and then we get that full well back. So that's what we've got here. Then we're going to call the GUI and show the well. So, and that's it. Like, that's the whole thing. Um, and the end result is that, remember, we get a random piece. So every time I run, uh, every time I run this, some different, some different piece is going to show up. Well, see? So each time I run this, a different piece is going to show up. And that's all I wanted to see. That was the big test. Can I actually draw something or not? Now, I can't move yet. Remember, if I push a key, I'm going to get a report, which is showing me what the uh, actual character hook thing was. You see the false, false, false stuff up here? Um, some of that's like... Is control pressed down? Is meta pressed down? Is alt pressed down? Is shift pressed down? Which shift is pressed down? All that stuff actually comes out in these key character events. The only thing I really care about is the uh, the key point value for the actual key press itself. I just pressed an arrow key, so 314 came out. I would never remember that normally, so that's what this that's what the purpose of this debug thing is. And then we've got the little SSS thing in there uh, inside of the state, uh, the well that the GUI is remembering, uh, that shows up. So that that was the whole purpose of this, was kind of to, to figure out, um, can I make pieces? Are my piece coordinate values correct for the points? Can I show that on the screen? Do I have all the right code in place to show the GUI without it just being a complete mess or crashing instantly or whatever? That's the purpose of this commit. Uh, so we've got the data type that was in the previous commit, the well and the piece, those are the two big important ones. Uh, and then in this commit, we've actually drawn drawn some of those pieces in the interface and proven that we can do that. Uh, and each one of these commits actually runs. So this was uh, a nice little bit of coding that I was able to do pretty quickly, and it was fairly lightweight. I wasn't buried under a whole lot of um, extra you know, concerns as I wrote these because you know, the, this doing it in these steps instead of getting into gameplay, verifying that pieces look like pieces, verifying that I can draw to the screen, verifying that I've got enough space to put everything in there, verifying that my uh, PNG images were, didn't look too crazy. Um, you know, all those things just kind of baby steps going forward incrementally uh, writing this program before I get into the much more, you know, code-intensive world of writing the actual game, the gameplay stuff. Uh, so I'm going to conclude this video here at this point. Uh, if you're following along, we've got the first commits here, first, second, third. So we're only three commits in. Um, draw the board with a random piece on it. If you're following along and you want to look in the repository, uh, this is the place where this stuff is. And you see my, my bitmap show up in the repository now at this point. Um, and you can see the, the diff, looking at the diff, which I'm sure you probably can't see in the video, uh, the diff just, it spells it out exactly what changed. It's very simple to see uh, and understand if you look at the, the different diffs. Um, you know, between commits. So anyway, I'm going to conclude this one here. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to talk about the uh, implementing the play control features, um, what I did with those keystrokes once I figured out what the actual keystrokes for the arrow, uh, for the arrow keys and so on actually are, um, how I use those to talk from the GUI back to the controller, how the controller change things in the world and tell the GUI to show it again, 
Uh, and I, I took a different approach with display also. Instead of showing the entire well every single time, um, I've separated the, uh, the piece from the well, the moving piece from the, the well status itself. Uh, and that, you know, that actually worked out well and we'll see how we'll see how all this stuff works um and uh, and what else gets added to the well and so on so we'll get into some more gameplay stuff uh next and thank you for watching um catch the next video if you're curious about how the gameplay itself works for tetris that's all i got bye